Hello, my students. How's everybody doing today? Do we know what week this is? This is according to my calendar here. This is week six. Last week was our midterm. Hopefully that went well for you. Like I said, I stayed with mainly the same questions. Maybe one or two trick questions, but they're in the reading so you can find the answer pretty easy. Nothing complicated, just to keep you on your toes for the students that, uh, I don't want to say cheat, but um, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, I'm always looking to help you guys. I miss you guys. I don't get to see you in person. Uh, that's why I really enjoy teaching. I love to see my students in person and uh, help you. But, um, you know. Uh, students who turn in their homework and what have you to me and still write me little comments. I, I really appreciate them because then it makes me feel like I'm actually uh, in the class uh, with you guys, you know, teaching you and joking around and having a good time, right? Especially during this um, COVID period, all right? Okay, so we're in the sixth week and uh, we're going to talk about Korea's three kingdoms and the early kind of prehistoric uh, history of uh, Korea, and then again, rolling on to the three kingdoms, okay? So hopefully we all, we all enjoy this. And again, if anybody needs any help or question about something, um, you know, when you send in your homework or what have you, you can just uh, email me. I had a student with a question recently about the, uh, it was a, a misprint. I was supposed to say, um, what did the Portuguese bring to Japan in 1543? But somehow it got misprinted from another question, the Portsmouth. Because later at the end we have, what was the Portsmouth treaty, right? And uh, so it got put there somehow. What did the Portsmouth bring to Japan in 1543? But if you read the material, you followed the lecture, you know, I went over that, that was a question strictly. So, you know, we're talking about the Portuguese. The, the key, I also gave you the date. Remember, I try not to ask you for a lot of dates. I'll try to give you dates because dates are confusing. So, again, any questions, I'm here to answer. Send me an email. And, uh, you know, we can talk. The syllabus, my phone number is there too. You can send me a text. Okay. All right. So without further ado, my students. Let me go to the top of the material. This thing wants to move. Okay, so as I told you, week six, HIS 103, Asian history. I might have to minimize my face or actually take it out so I don't cover any material, which uh, I'm sure the ladies will be happy since I'm not uh, as good looking as uh, Johnny Depp or uh, Tom Cruise or George Clooney, any of those guys. So. Uh, I'm just here to teach you, help you out. So we're ready to start. Uh, Wani, or not Wani, sorry, Wani. Uh, Lee Shran, you're the lady that always buys the book. So for you to have the book, then you, letting you know would be on page 79, okay? 79, all right. The emergence of Korean kingdoms. The emergence means something that comes forward. Like we always say the emergence of maybe a submarine out of the water. One day you can't see it, the next day, wow, it just kind of like appears. So before there were no Korean kingdoms. And then suddenly we had the emergence of Korean kingdoms. And here we have early Korea, 2000 BCE to 313 CE. 
the first one obviously is before Christ. Uh, any of my students around during this time? I know some of my students think I was. Oh, teacher, you were around 2000 BC? No, I came 3000 BC, right? I had to wait another thousand years. So here we go. By the seventh century, as Buddhism was taking firm root, which was, means established in Japan, the great age of division had finally ended in China. This Chinese age of division coincides, which means happens at the same time, with the dawn of recorded history for both Korea and Japan. And the first stirrings or showings of a culturally coherent East Asian region. So let me explain that a little for you. If something is, okay, you have coherent, right? That means understandable. Um, people used to talk like this. If someone would say, hey, you know, an older person would say, uh, you're speaking incoherently. Uh, can you speak, can you please speak coherently, right? So I can understand you instead of sounding like the, mumblings of a drunk uh, person. So what this means here is and what happens, I think, in every eventual country that gets to be unified as a country. Uh, since we're going back thousands of years, there's a lot of different tribes of people or different groups of people with uh, different languages. So those areas, Japan, Mongolia, they have to wait for them to be unified with someone like a Genghis Khan, you know, someone else in Japan. So uh, what it means is the first stirrings of a culturally coherent East Asian region. So before that time, you could not really say, this is Japan, this is uh, Korea, this is uh, Mongolia or what have you. They were just areas where different tribes were, right, and different languages and cultures. And as you'll see here when we read about Korea, we'll talk about the different kinds of Korean people in the North originally as compared to the South, what influences became there. Long before this time, however, for many thousands of years, human beings had already inhabited or lived on both the Korean Peninsula and the Japanese islands. Both Korea and Japan enjoyed lengthy and culturally rich prehistoric eras. Pottery, for example, was being made on the Korean Peninsula as early as 10,000 BC. In Korea, an age of megalithic large stones, monuments, reminiscent of the dolmens of prehistoric Europe, which means they look the same or similar, began around 2000 BCE. Northern style dolmens in Korea were typically formed by four upright stone slabs capped by an overhanging horizontal lid, roughly in the shape of a stone table. Some of these were very large. Dolmens in southern style, which did not have the large uplifting vertical side pieces, are associated with burials. The purpose for the table shaped dolmens is less clear. Estimates of the total number of prehistoric stone monuments in Korea range as high as an astonishing or shockingly. 100,000, while dolmens can also be found in adjacent, which means uh, separate, close by uh, regions beyond the Korean Peninsula. They are concentrated in Korea and were evidently an indigenous development. So again, when you say indigenous, it means the first people who were in an area. So those people were not as of yet called 
Koreans. So uh, my green students, if you're still a little corn-fused about this dolmens and these things, it, what they're saying, how you, so you can understand this, uh, obviously here they're not talking about Jejido, but I would say these are the brothers of the Dol Haruban, right? The Dol Haruban are the first prehistoric carvings uh, found in Jejido, you know? And as far as uh, I know, and I'm not Korean, at least not 100%, right? uh, they have three nicknames, the Dol Harubans. They are the grandfathers, the mushrooms, and then finally the, uh, let's just say something a man has. So when we're talking about these dolmens and things in the regular peninsula from the north to the south, just think of, of something similar to the uh, Dol Haruban, okay? Uh, by last millennium BCE, rice farming and bronze metalworking had been added to the prehistoric cultural complex in Korea. Rice cultivation probably originated in what is now southern China. So maybe Guangzhou area. But rice was little grown in the Chinese cultural heartland in the north. I wonder if my Chinese students knew that. So if they didn't have a lot of rice, what were the Chinese people eating instead? Now, see, if I had Gao, she's a Chinese history major, she could probably tell you. So she would probably say, oh, they were eating uh, frijoles, which were brought in from Mexico. But, uh, I don't know if I knew you were always lying to me. Um, so Chinese culture, Harlan, where little rice was grown, where the staple grain was, ah, millet. Don't know how to say millet in Chinese. And later wheat. So I wonder why Chinese people stopped with the millet and said rice was better. Very interesting. Bronze, uh, meanwhile, may have been an influence from North China, but there is a notable lack of characteristic Chinese-style bronze ritual vessels, which means pots, and in Korea where bronze was commonly used instead for daggers and mirrors. Dagger is a knife. So very interesting. Bronze was used in China for all these kinds of pots and bowls for ritual eating and uh, things that they did. But Korea re preferred to use them for knives and mirrors. I guess knives for the men and mirrors for the beautiful ladies. In a number of ways, therefore, late prehistoric culture in China, excuse me, Korea was distinct, which means very different from that of the central plain in China. Very interesting. Different people doing different things with similar products. The first written accounts of what we now call Korea, however, come from Chinese sources. And I guess that's probably due to the fact that Chinese people, I think, were around before the Koreans, at least in recorded history. So that's why the Chinese are writing about Korea. Little was recorded. Uh, let me see, did this jump? Yeah, see, it jumped. Let me check all the way through. Ah. Oh. Let me see, has this thing gone crazy? Something is strange here.
Okay, that's not good. That's at the end. Okay, oops. Okay, let's go through this again, step by step. Okay, so I've read this. Okay, this is, this is acting up. Okay, just uh, check something really quick. Hopefully it doesn't act up again. Huh. This is jumped. Ooh. Getting angry with this thing now. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try to go back to the, uh, now that's taking me to the end. I'm gonna try to go back to the beginning. And just be very careful. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back to the beginning. This thing is getting, uh, as we say, squirrely. I just have to match these. See, I don't wanna lose you and I've lost you. Okay, so, okay, we've already read through here, the dolmens. Okay, Southern style. We were here, the first written accounts of what we now call Horea. Okay. Okay, and nothing was written concerning the war surrounding the collapse of the Qin Empire and the founding of the Han Dynasty. When a refugee named Wan Ni, oh, sorry, that's my student. A refugee, this is a Chinese refugee, named Wiman fled to Northern Korea and established a small kingdom there called Chosun in Wan 9-5 BCE. Maybe that should be a question on the final exam since we've already had the midterm. Brooding over a mixed population of natives, okay, people that were there originally, which will be called Koreans later, and then refugees like himself, possibly Chinese. Over three generations, friction or fighting developed between his Chosun kingdom and the Han dynasty. In 108 BC, he, Emperor Wu, Bao Wu, of the Han Dynasty, invaded and conquered Chosun. At its peak thereafter, roughly the northern half of the Korean Peninsula was directly incorporated into the Han Chinese Empire. Again, that is the northern half and Pyongyang, so what is considered northern Korea. Uh, to this day. So I guess this Chinese refugee uh, related to uh, Wani in my class, Wima, uh, which I didn't uh, know that prior. Chosun was originally developed by a Chinese refugee. Oh, the scandal. Okay, to the right, there's a little photo, a bird-shaped earthen world vessel from Korea. Hmm, birdie. Okay. So I should press, oh, well, actually, if I'm somehow on this photo, I've got questions to ask, okay? Okay, so let me go attend to those. Okay, whiteboard. Yay, let me get the pencil. Because you know who usually steals my pencil? It's the Mongolian gang. 
my dear buddies, Purevi and uh, Temujin. Okay. So, question one. Oops. I guess I should do a capital, right? It doesn't want. Look at that. Okay, if it doesn't want, doesn't want. You guys can read it. Look at that. Playing games with me. This machine today. I have to maybe change the laptop. Okay, question one, it's a long one, but your answer will be much shorter. What was added to the Korean prehistoric cultural complex in Korea? So if you're having a little time, hard time trying to grapple with that, again, first questions come from the first part of the reading, the first page. So once you find that, you should be able to connect that to the answer. Okay, we're ready for two. I think he's not ready yet. He's thinking about her handsome boyfriend right now. Number two, where did the first written accounts of what we now call Korea come from? So is this a trick question? Is the answer just Korea or could it be from a different country, right? Maybe Mexico was the first country to actually write about the history of Korea. Who knows? You know, I would never, I would never trick you guys, you know me. But my students trick me all the time. Always tell me little lies, you know, get away and I catch them at the Starbucks. Three. Oops, I made this not want to think too much of my students. We bond. Three, what did Chinese refugee Wi Man do in Northern Korea in 195 BCE? What did he do? Did he open the first Disneyland in Korea? Or let me say, Korea, I don't think has a Disneyland. Uh, it's a Lotte World. Yeah, he opened a Lotte World. 
in 195 BCE, even before there were carbs. Right. Okay, give yourself some thought on that. And I have one more question from this page and a half that we did, because the one with the horsey, or birdie, sorry, was a little short. make this really accurate, more accurate here. Question four, the last on this page and a half. How long would a large part, so that means not all of Northern Korea, but a large part, uh, how long would a large part of Northern Korea remain under Chinese rule? Was it a short time? Was it uh, only three days? A couple of weeks? Was it... Uh, over 20 years or longer than that. If you follow my lecture, then you shall know the answer. So um, I shall give you a few minutes to answer those and let me make my markings. So I'm gonna get more lost than what I was already. Mark down that I've asked you these groups of questions. gone over the appropriate uh, pages for uh, 1E. So for you, 1E, that would be 79 and 80, even though 80 was kind of like a half a pager, right? With the, the birdie that was there. Okay, we done there. Is it time for me to grab the eraser? All right. Eraser. Okay, again, number one, helping you guys out here. What was added to the Korean prehistorical cultural complex in Korea? Believe it or not, I've had some students that didn't pay attention in the past. And then they just read this and they say, well, was that a Korean? And they put kimchi for the answer. I don't know what they were thinking, but those things happen. Okay, two, where did the first written accounts of what we now call Korea come from? Temujin told me his answer is going to be Mexico. And why? He said, because Tull told him that was the answer. I, would tell him, please be careful when trusting ladies. They might tease you. Okay. Three, what did Chinese refugee Wiman do in North Korea in 195 BCE? Maybe he opened the first Panda Express in North Korea. Maybe not. Okay, three's gone. Four, how long would a large part of Northern Korea remain under Chinese rule? So you got two guesses there, short time or a long time. And those are, what I've just told you are also kind of uh, hints or slash tricks, okay? There's the evidence again, or the police looking for Pamela. Her and uh, Ken and Caroline have probably stolen another car. If they ask me, I've never seen those students, so I don't know what the police are talking about. Okay, so four must be gone now. Ah, yeah. Okay. All 
right? Oh, I came back. You don't want to see me, right? Oh my gosh. So I'm going back to the material. Okay, that's good. So let me try to match this up. Well, so it's kind of tricky chopping up these pages to make a PowerPoint. So it's not an easy job. So let me see what I got here next. Oh, there we go. Let me just try to match these. Oh, that's the underlying of the photo. Okay. All right. So let me continue. Mm, at least a position, a portion of Northern Korea would remain under Chinese rule for some four centuries. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, you have the tape, you can catch it. Until 313 CE. The principal seat of Chinese rule was called Lelang. Oh, I have to ask my Chinese students, is that true? In Korean, it was called Nang Nang. Nang Nang. Sounds like grandmother, hey Nang Nang. Uh, an administrative city located near modern Pyo. Oh no, Pyongyang, right? Those are where the Pyo people came from. Um, archaeological evidence, which means uh, stones or records, things that they found, makes it clear that the local cultures. Um, in, in the area of Korea remain distinct or very different from the standards of the Chinese central plain. Okay, so very, very different. But Han Dynasty Chinese administration in Korea was not necessarily any more though also certainly no less, in parentheses, a matter of foreign imperial, meaning Chinese, meaning the foreigners in Korea, colonial rule than it was in a number of other parts of still white multi-ethnic, so different tribes of the Han Empire. Under the early Chinese empire, it was not uncommon for local culture to vary from metropolitan imperial standards. As late as the Han Dynasty, it had been suggested, uh, I mean, it, it has even been suggested that the language uh, spoken near what is now Beijing may have been still foreign to the Chinese ear and rather close to the languages spoken in the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. Like I said, I wish I had a Gao here that we could uh, talk about, but that sounds very interesting. All that time years ago and the language didn't sound like the Chinese spoken, but oh, hmm. nice. Um, if the native populations under Han Dynasty rule in Korea, or as my students say, Korea, look again, remain culturally distinct from the Chinese imperial metropolitan elite who were in power. However, they also did not yet constitute or make up a single unified and homogeneous Korean people either. So there was not, that's what my Koreans used to tell me many years ago when I started in Koreatown teaching one blood. There were a lot of different folks that, that I guess eventually came together to be Korean. Sounds very similar to the Mongolian situation uh, where Genghis Khan had to bring together many different tribes to make it a unified uh, Mongolia that we know of today. Internally, there remained a surprising variety of different ethnic groups 
and externally, the borders of anything that might be called Korea had yet even to be imagined because people were living and there was no, actually I should say more like surviving. And there's no media, no nothing. So people don't have time to sit back and watch Korean soap operas or soccer games or who knows what, cooking shows. People had to survive. Although as a peninsula, the geographic map of Korea might appear to have been drawn by the very hand of nature itself. The modern land border with the north, which now follows the line of the Yalu, but he been to the Yalu River, I was there fishing, but I couldn't catch any fish. And the two men rivers was not actually fixed until as late as the 15th century C. An influential Korean book written in 1784. Does anybody know the name of that book? Any Korean historians here? Uh, this book from 1784 could still claim that the peninsula, peninsula was really only the southern part of a Korean identity that more properly extended well north into Manchuria, which we know is China. That's interesting because I know that uh, during World War II, a lot of Koreans moved over to Manchuria. Hmm, did they realize that they might be reconnecting with their ancestors? Uh, in the South, even the water's edge was not necessarily an inevitable endpoint, which means stopping point for the peninsula or people. On a clear day, the Japanese island of Tsushima can be seen from the coast of Korea. And in the third century, this appears to have been an area connected by water rather than separated by it, across which one of the most common scenes must have been people going back and forth in their boats. So a lot of, I don't know if I should say easy travel, but uh, accessible travel between uh, what later would be called Korea and what later would be called Japan. So who knows about the mixing there or the original people being the same, right? Very interesting. So as we're learning here, the northern part of Korea has seemed to be very connected to China. And the southern part of what will be called Korea seems to be very connected to Japan. And so I'm in the middle of uh, Wani. I would, I would tell you it's uh, 81. A third century Chinese history, the Sangwo Shi, or Chronicles of the Three Kingdoms, describes, where'd my arrow go? Okay, there it went. Several different people, uh, or groups of people, occupying the general area that uh, we now call Korea. The Puyo, which again is why we get Pyongyang later, uh, lived well north of the peninsula in central Manchuria. And again, Manchuria we know is in China. Only time it wasn't was 
controlled by the Japanese. It was called Machuko. Mr. Fuji, charge. And might not seem relevant or important, except that according to Korean legend, the Puyo were directly ancestral to other more obviously Korean people, such as the Oryo. So it's saying even though they were way up there in China, it doesn't seem that they were ethnically related to the Chinese, but to another Korean group known as the Puyo. To the south of Puyo in southern Manchuria and in the Chinese Han Dynasty, uh, an administrative area of northern Korea, the kingdom of Koryo was emerging or coming forth, coming forward that people could actually see what it was. Maybe originally it was a small group of people into a town, into a small city, and now emerging into a kingdom where Alex's grandfather was king in the first place. Uh, Koryo had completely replaced the Chinese government in northern Korea by 313. Koryo was said to be a splinter group of the Puyo, so now we're talking about the connection there, and resembled or looked like the Puyo in language and culture. And those are two important uh, steps. East of Koryo, bordering on the ocean, were the Okcho people, whose language was said to be slightly different from that of Koryo. South of Okcho were the Yemek or Ye people, living along the eastern seaboard of the Korean Peninsula. In the southern half of the peninsula, beyond the maximum zone of Han Dynasty Chinese administration, were the three Korean Han peoples. Despite the similarity of pronunciation, the Korean name Han is written with an entirely different character from the name of the Chinese Han dynasty. And I would have thought they would have been the same since originally Koreans borrowed the Chinese, but it's not. So that's an interesting key to the history. So I'm at the bottom of the page of 81. Uh, Wani or Li Xuan. Uh, these three Han, Sam Han peoples were probably linguistically and culturally, which means language, most directly ancestral to modern Koreans. Since the eventual unification of the Korean Peninsula, precisely, I'm sorry, I was doing my British accent. Okay, was achieved by a kingdom that emerged from one of them in the Southeast. In the third century, however, uh, they were themselves still far from unified. It takes a lot to unify different peoples. The three were called Mahan in the Southwest, Pyonhan in the center, and Chinhan in the Southeast. According to the Chinese account, Chinhan and Mahan did not even speak the same language. Wow. 
now we kind of know why it was tough to get them together, huh? Mahan by itself was described as a collection of over 52 so-called countries, yo, in the third century. These countries were apparently small, agricultural or farming communities scattered, which means everywhere, between the mountains and the sea without walled cities. Hmm. The largest reportedly contained and that brings me to the bottom of this page. So I have to ask questions here. Okay. Oh, there I am again, don't wanna do that. Hello, I'm just keeping you even, uh, whiteboard. Okay, pencil. Okay, so. We're on to question five. Let me get the spelling correct here. Okay, question five. Name the three early groups of Koreans at this time. Okay. I don't know why I'm fascinated with making this long. It really doesn't matter, but I guess I can't control myself. So again, name the three early groups of Koreans at this time. Again, reminding you I've had silly um, students in the past that didn't study, didn't pay attention. So I've had a couple of Korean guys. Name the three early groups of Koreans and they're guessing. So they say, Kia, uh, Dewu, Hanchande. Like I'm not asking about the early cars, but you know, my guys will do what they will do. Okay, six. And it looks like I'm only gonna ask you two questions on this long page. That's not good, I should be tougher than that. So I think I need some kind of donation, you know, maybe uh, $100 from each student. So you have my email there. Um, so you can send the money to the email or uh, give me a text and I'll know where to, uh, uh, give me my bank account so you can send it that way too, okay? So I'm being too kind. Okay, there again, doesn't want the hap. Oopsie. See if I can stretch this one out again. Which Koreans lived in the southern part of Korea at this time? Okay, so again, don't give me the Kia, Hyundai, Daewoo. 
of which Koreans live. Okay, so uh, in this case, <laughs> in this case, I don't know. If students thought I was talking about Southern California because they weren't paying attention in class. So I get the oh, the Koreans lived in, the, in Southern California. Yeah, so they lived in the K Town, Garden Grove, and uh, Northridge in the Valley. I'm like, ah, that's not my question. So I'll. Uh, uh, give you guys a minute or two to get that. Let me make my markings. Wani, that would be, uh, or Dishwan, that would be uh, 81 for you. So I'm marking that off. And then mark that I've asked you these two questions or questions. Let me bring the book back so I can match VR without getting lost. Is that enough time, uh, Inky or Monk Bayar? Tall, I tall, how you doing, tall? I like the little things you send me in the uh, assignments of the email. Just take care of Tamojan, you'll be fine. Okay, Racer. Okay, five. Name the three early groups of Koreans at this time. So for one last time, I don't want cards. Six so which Koreans lived in the southern part of Korea at this time. Oh, also don't give me the southern Koreans. That would be bad. That means you're trying to cheat. Okay, that's done. Okay. Back there. Oh, get that guy out of there. Back to the material. All right. So, uh, let me match this. We were down here. Uh, the largest reportedly contained. Now I'll switch over. On, we're on 82. Okay. So the largest reportedly contained over 10,000. This is one of the city's uh, households, and the smallest only a few thousand. Pyonhan and Chinhan were both less populous, which means less people, each having only a dozen somewhat smaller countries. In Pyonhan and Chinhan, especially people tattooed their bodies and used stones to compress the heads of newborn babies into an artificially narrow shape. That reminds me of something. Um, again, when I started teaching many, many years ago, K Town, uh, I still had Korean students telling me about um, how they would have their kids sleep a certain way because they wanted to have a flat forehead. I don't hear about that anymore. But, uh, I'll have to ask somebody about that. Okay, so again, Pyonhan was also notable as a major producer of iron for the entire region. The people of Koryo were in the north, were highlanders, which means they were people from the mountain, San people. Uh, who occupied rugged mountains terrain and lacked any very satisfactory agricultural base. Yes, usually high up in the mountains, it's not easy to grow things, but you need like the rice or wheat or millet. Or like Puri, he says, I cannot grow the marijuana here. That's, that's good. In the third century, 
their population was reported at 30,000 households. Wow. They were allegedly warlike, okay, means they like to start fighting in war, and rode small ponies, little horses. They were adept at clambering over mountains, which means getting over mountains when they rode these horses. In striking contrast to the most typical Chinese marriage practice, which was what, Li Xuan? What was the typical Chinese marriage practice? That where the husband to be never sees the woman until the wedding day, which is okay if she looks like only, in which the bride moves in with her husband's parents. Ooh. It was said that the husband moved into a smaller son-in-law's house constructed behind the bride's parents' home. This doesn't sound good for the guy. And the newly married couple continued to live there until their own children were adults. It's kind of like what I've seen happen here with, uh, you know, I had a couple of friends that had married a little too young because, uh, you know, somebody got pregnant. I don't know how. And I say that in all honesty because I, I don't have any kids, so I, I would say I don't know how to make a child. I never read that book. And so they were like still in high school or whatever. So a lot of times they moved into their uh, parents' garage. That's what this reminds me of. Okay, I'm towards the middle of the page now. The three kingdoms. Korea. 313 to 668 CE. Okay. Koryo was the first of the communities in Korea to form a politically organized, oh, politically mm. educated folks there, territorial kingdom. In the year 32 CE, the Koryo leader, for the first time, supposedly took the Chinese title King Wang. I thought that's what Chinese dogs say. Wang, Wang. So are the Chinese dogs saying, I am King Wang, Wang. I am King. Hmm. Let's find out. So Korean dogs say Mong Mong. So, hmm, I don't know. Mong Kitty. With the gradual weakening of the Chinese Han Dynasty, Koryo began raiding its borders, which means attacking and stealing, uh, in the early second century. After the total collapse, of the Han Dynasty by 220. A lot of numbers thrown at you folks, but uh, don't worry. You do not have to remember these numbers that I know of. <laughs> uh, Southern Manchuria was left as a political vacuum, which means it was usually empty and then could be filled by different groups such as filled by the rise of various Xiambe or non-Chinese states. By around the year 300, these Xiambe states had effectively severed or cut off communication between China and Northern Korea. And in 313, the last Chinese administration in Korea fell to Korea. Okay. Again, we're exactly in the middle now of page 82, where Li Xuan. 
by the fifth century, the chaos of the, I guess if you're in the east part of the state, you might call chaos. But the west of the we call chaos. Of the fourth century age, of the Fai Hu and 16 kingdoms, 304 to 439, had stabilized considerably into two large, <coughs> excuse me, and powerful states in Northern East Asia. The Tuaba Xiangbe ruled Northern Wei Dynasty in North China. So again, Xiangbe mean foreigners. And Koryo in Southern Manchuria in Northern Korea. Both states had non-Chinese rulers, see? Although Northern Wei presumably had a Chinese majority subject population, so foreign ruler, but most of the people were Chinese. But both Northern Wei and Kurio had also by this time absorbed or taken in a substantial amount of Chinese culture, helping to convert the Tuoba Xiangbe Northern Way into a reasonable facsimile, like copy of a legitimate Chinese dynasty, and touching off a process of East Asian secondary state formation that would eventually extend the length of the Korean Peninsula, wow, far, and across the sea to Japan, even farther. In 372 or 372, Koryo had established an academy for the study of the Chinese classics and in 373, Koryo promulgated all oh, okay, together. What kind of a word is that? It's first Chinese style law codes. So promulgated is formed, made. In 427, Koryo moved its capital from what is today the Chinese side of the Yalu River in Manchuria to the vicinity of modern Pyongyang in northern Korea. The focus of Koryo's attention by this time was increasingly directed toward domination of the Korean Peninsula. So Koryo wanted it all. Not really at the bottom of the page, so get ready for some questions soon. The second of the Korean Three Kingdoms, Pakche, was founded according to Korean legend by the son of the founder of Koryo. I think his name was Alex, Alex Wong. Like Koryo, Therefore, the Pakche Royal, so uh, we'll stop it there because it's towards the bottom. So don't want to get more confused. Okay. Time for some questions. Whiteboard. And still, come on. Question seven. As they used to say when I was living in Japan, they had these commercials and all oh, they ran them like every five minutes. Seven, eleven, ikebon. Oh, I went crazy listening to that stuff.
a long question, but it's going to be a very short answer. Again, donations, bebostain at gmail.com. This one's so long, I'm not even going to mess with it. I'm not going to straighten it out. It's too long. Uh, which was the first community in Korea to form a... Let me fix this. I, didn't, I, I missed a vowel. Oh. Okay. Wata. Um, to form a politically organized territorial kingdom. We went over the name, so just think of the name. Say, oh, it was a uh, K-Town. Right. And I just said I wasn't going to stretch it, and I did, so I'm telling fibs. That's okay. I worry so much about my students. I better stop. And again, each one we're on. I'm getting these from uh, page 82. Okay, eight, the magic number for Chinese folks. All forms of eight. Does that mean I should get eight wives? Well, I'll be very lucky. Or will they all steal my millions of dollars that I have in my shoe box under the bed? Okay, so eight is connected to seven. So when you get the answer to seven, then you can uh, catch eight. So uh, once you get the answer to seven, you'll get eight. So what did this kingdom establish? Basketball courts, freeways. What 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 could they have established? Question nine. I'm actually asking three questions on one page. It's getting tough now. Students are getting too easy. Okay, I'll try to stretch this one out for you guys. But the question first is, a son of this kingdom later founded what? I'll just move that there. I think this man's name was Le Sok. Anyway, he founded something later. So let me give you a few minutes to answer those. Let me mark off that I asked you three questions for 82. And let me actually read page 82. All right. Let me bring the book back. Gotta match things up here. Go 
for the eraser. Doesn't look like any of my Mongolian guys tried to snag the eraser today. Good boys. I like it. Not used to it, but I like it. Sevon, which was the first community in Korea to form a politically organized territorial kingdom. I'm gonna go with Kedong. Eight, what did this kingdom establish in 372? Was it the first bulgogi restaurant in Korea? Is that what they established? Nine, a son of this kingdom, Lesok, later founded what? Okay. Thank you. That's done. Oh, gotta get that guy out of there. Okay, back to the illustrious reading. Let me match this up. Okay, second. So like Cordio, therefore, the Pakche Royal line claimed Puyo descent, that's why the relation. Pakche was initially only one of the more than 50 small countries in the Mahan region of Southwestern Korea. And it took shape out of the gradual consolation of those Mahan communities with a presumably predominantly Mahan population, whether or not its rulers were really of Puyo descent. So Lishuan, just to let you know, we're on 83, okay? If you're following along in the book. Okay. Contact between Pakche and a Chinese dynasty was first recorded in 372. By 386, the Pakche ruler had been invested or given with such Chinese titles as general garrisoning the East or protecting with the uh, military power or and king of Pakche. The keeping of written records also reportedly first began in Pakche around the mid fourth century. In the fifth and sixth centuries, Pakche would enjoy particularly close relations with Southern Dynasty China, hmm. becoming a highly sophisticated Chinese style kingdom. At the same time, Pakche also had important ties or connections with the newly emerging, now we're using the emerging for the state in Japan, uh, which I think the first king or queen, her last name was Imagawa, right? And we have a nice picture here of the Sila period, Korean silver crown. So move this. And, uh, Bura Bura, Asian art history, that's what's underneath. So at the very bottom now. Uh, the third Korean kingdom, Shila, developed out of a community called Saro. I thought it was called Saba Saba. Okay. In the Chinhan region of southeastern Korea. This was the most remote and the slowest to develop of all the Korean three kingdoms. It was not until 503 that Silan leaders finally abandoned native titles such as Marip Khan and took the Chinese title King. It was also in 503 that Sila was first standardized as the name of the country. How many of you guys know that? In 520, Shila promulgated its first Chinese-style law codes, 
by around 535, opposition to Buddhism was overcome and Buddhism was officially endorsed in Shilla. And uh, 545, Oops, okay, I'll just read this. By royal command, Shila began the compilation or stacking of a written history of the kingdom. Okay, so I've got questions to answer there for 83, because it's a that was a quicker rule. Whiteboard. Again, that was 83. So I've got uh, two questions there. What's the one right? Come on now. Oh, look at this. Did I get the wrong time? Let me get the eraser. Something happened there. I got tricked. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Long questions, short answers. I must be too kind. Okay, 10. Which of these three kingdoms would develop important relations with Japan. If you can't remember them, good, then I can give you a hint. Probably the one closest to Japan. That's an easy guess or rule. Okay. And, uh, I'm only gonna ask you another one on this page because it's a shorty. Even shorter question, the shorter answer. What was the name of the third Korean kingdom? Let me stretch that out. Oh, stretch, touch your toes. There you go. Okay. So let me give you a minute to do those. Okay, I've asked you the two questions for 83. It's okay. good. All right, go for the eraser. Ten, which of these three kingdoms would develop important relations with Japan? I don't know. Any of my Japanese students know in here? Miss Migawa? I don't know. I don't know, are there more Japanese students in the class? I'll have to look. Okay, 11, what was the name of the third Korean kingdom? It was called uh, Gulgumi House. No, okay. So that's gone. Let me proceed to can you guess our last page? Yay. This will be our last page of the reading today. Aren't you excited? So let me get the book and see if I can match up where we are. So Buddhism was overcome and Buddhism was. So for our last page, it will be a half a rule also. So, uh, Yishuan, we will be on uh, 84.
All right. What the Koreans were learning from China in these centuries were the institutions and techniques of state building. Despite the spread of Chinese influences, it should be emphasized that the Korean three kingdoms were all characterized by warrior uh, aristocracies, which the, those are the high level people, supposed to be sophisticated, but they were warriors, not uh, people after fine wines. And quite distinct from the Chinese literati, of the usually Chinese elite were tried to be more modern after or modeled after scholars not warriors, and many aspects of traditional native culture survive. Most people in Koryo continue to live in simple thatched huts, which means their roofs were made from the uh, different tree leaves around the area, with only royal palaces, government offices, and Buddhist temples adopting heavy Chinese style tiled roofs, so many, many years before the blue tiled roofs of uh, Korea. Yet one Chinese account nonetheless insists that by the seventh century, even the poorest villages and humblest families in Korea encouraged study of the written word and built imposing structures where unmarried young men gathered to recite the Confucian classics and practice archery. Okay, on to the very last part of our last page, A4. Aside from their obvious distinctions from the Chinese, these three early Korean kingdoms were also apparently somewhat different from each other in both language and custom. Interesting. Each had, for example, their own distinctive ceramic traditions. The monumental tumuli called old tombs, kobun, that appeared in each of the three kingdoms between the fourth and seventh centuries had somewhat different regional styles. Stone burial chambers with painted murals in Koryo, arched brick chambers in Hakche, and wooden coffins piled over with stone in the Shila. The three kingdoms um, were also more or less constantly at war with each other. You guys have bad tempers, shouldn't do that. At the same time though, they were continuously exchanging influences. In the 17th century, they would finally be unified for the first time in what could even be called the birth of Korea. Okay. On to the last questions. Let me see how kind I should be because we're running at the end of time here and I have uh, three questions scheduled, but that might take us over and then Inky and Monk Bayard and maybe Gumi if Gumi's around, they're gonna start yelling because they don't want to go over the time. So maybe I'll have to cut off a question or two. So let me see, what's the important questions here? Okay, this one's important. Twelve. What was Korea learning from China at this time? And if I got my Chinese student from Oakland, don't put how to make noodles. That's not a good answer. Let me stretch it out for you. All right. So that's an important one. Probably be on the final. What was Korea learning from China at the time? Now let me see. I've got two more. Should I throw one away or both? Okay, I'll tell you what, the next one I'll throw away 
but I will ask you the last one. This is an important one. Okay, so I'll throw away 13 and I'll ask you 14. Okay. I'll throw away 13 so I can ask you 14. Just to let you know again, sometimes people don't listen when I speak. They're sleeping or doing Candy Crush or I don't know what's going on. Hi, oh, okay. So remember, I don't want some funny guy like Temujin. Uh, teacher forgot to put 13. I have to complain to the office. I threw it away. Don't worry about it. Okay. I'm going from 12 to 14. So when did these three kingdoms unite for the first time? When? When did that happen? Don't tell me, oh, it was uh, 2020 this year, they finally got together. No, I think before that time. Let me give you a minute to answer those. Mark that we completed 84. Mark that I asked you 12 and 14. Again, 13, we threw in the garbage, okay? All right, so. As they erase these two, we're getting ready to go. Go and have a good time with your life. Enjoy your life. Life is short. Be good to people. Don't be bad to people. and You shall have a nicer life. 12, what was Korea learning from China at this time? Again, my Chinese man from Oakland said it was noodles, but I don't think so. An eraser. That one's gone. We skipped 13, 14. When did these three kingdoms finally unite for the first time? Maybe 1970? No, okay, take your shot there. All right, so thank you for coming to my class this week, the sixth week, uh, International University of the East for Asian History. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I made it enjoyable for you. I miss you guys. And, uh, I hope to see you next quarter. Okay. So until that time, bye bye. Okay. And this.